Welcome to Risk and Trends, Politica Insights Annual Conference. This year, due to the unpredictability caused by the pandemic, we decided to organize an audience-less conference in our studio. In 10 thematic blocks, together with our friends, partners and guests, we'll try to tell the world as we see it. My name is Marek Swierczyński and I'm Head of Security and International Affairs Desk at Politica Insight. Today, I'm pleased to lead the conversation about the impact that the events of 2020, especially the coronavirus pandemic, had on our perceptions of security in personal, national and international dimension. My guest in this conversation is Thomas Kleine Brockhoff, Vice President of the German Marshall Fund of the United States and Head of its Berlin office. Thomas is one of the leading voices in transatlantic security debate in Germany in Europe and between the old continent and the United States. I've met Thomas a few years ago and I was lucky to take part in many events, conferences and workshops where I've learned that he always offers in-depth, very thoughtful, mature analysis of events and trends as well as excellent, sharp and remarkably bright conclusions with a pinch of optimism so much needed in this gloom time of pandemic uh, world. So Thomas Kleine Brockhoff, Welcome to Politica Insights Risks and Trends 2021. Thank you, Marek, also for this very kind introduction. Happy to have you with us. For the start, let's take a few steps back from the headlines, policies and politics. Uh, and let's look in people's minds. Let's compare the two shocks that we've witnessed to, uh, in the recent few years. 2014 was a year of shock in terms of military aggression happening just outside our borders, uh, at our doorstep. Frightful, especially to those who live near the aggressor, but not necessarily so to the rest of Europe, uh, let alone the rest uh, of the world. This time it is much different. The year 2020 brought the real and present danger to everyone's life and instantly this was reflected in opinions. The most feared security threat was immediately related to the pandemics, health systems, illness prevention and care, not those uh, related to military uh, issues which were so dominant uh, not long time ago and also the climate catastrophe was sort of marginalized in the threat perception polls. Is this change an element of, of this shock which will pass as soon as the pandemic eases or could it permanently change people's thinking and also the political decision about what does it mean to be secure? In other words, how deep will be the impact of 2020? Um, essentially, there's a number of schools on, 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 this, on this question. Um, one of the schools is sort of, let's call it the 9-11 school. So the, the world has permanently changed. This is a fork in the road. Nothing will ever be the same from our, uh, the, the way we communicate to the way we interact politically with each other. The second uh, school is the is the trend accelerator school that this trend um, that this th this uh, this incident the coronavirus um, accelerates already existing uh, trend trends and then there is a smaller school who who will say that at some point the quality of a, a gradual change accelerating existing changes. Uh, is qualitatively so different that we find ourselves in the new in the new world. Let me say something counterintuitive. There are elements where this crisis, the current crisis, will, in my view, play less of a role than we currently think. <laughs> we had forgotten all about the Spanish flu um, in 1919, 1920. Because what we remember is World War One, but not the Spanish flu. Uh, 
We also don't remember that the, the roaring 20s that followed have something to do with the combination of, 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 of the two and, and a burst of optimism and joy in life. So I could very well imagine that uh, the corona pandemic of, of 2020 is nothing like the Black Death of 1348, um, which is with us in our collective memories even 700 years later. Um, but that we would rather see the Spanish flu, though we have to dig up, uh, dig up history books in order to find out what really happened in 2020. So I, I, th I see a, a, an element of snapback that we will have once we have the vaccine effective globally, which will might take another year or even more. But that there is the trend accelerator uh, that, that, will, um, that will be with us because there will have been changes induced, changes induced by this crisis that will that will be there to last and that will be there to affect us for a much longer period of time. And the most important one of those is the change of guard and the change of power, the transfer of power, the, uh, the growth and uh, growing assertiveness of China. You can call it a trend uh, accelerator, but I would call it an, a, a war in a new dimension because what we have seen in this 2020 was, you know, alliances cracking, great powers declining, and governments, even, you know, the super rich uh, governments of, of nations and, and blocks of nations, all of a sudden caught dependent on, you know, very basic but crucial supplies. And what we have seen is competition growing, even though, you know, at times we could see uh, cooperation expanding. So, Tell me, is this a, a manifestation of a new a dimension of international competition, or is it something that would actually um, strengthen cooperation? For instance, in case of the European Union, we could see something like a roller coaster of decisions uh, and, and criticism of those uh, decisions. And we're not yet, of course, through this, this process to see w what we will end up with. But my impression from 2020 is that this could lead to a new wave of international competition rather than cooperation. Yes, you would think that a pandemic is the, um, it, it is the ultimate example of international cooperation, because only through uh, international cooperation can you beat the virus. And only if we beat it everywhere, we have we will have beaten it somewhere. But what we see is the opposite. We have seen peak globalization a couple of years ago. Now we see an acceleration of deglobalization. Um, the EU's decision this past week to enact export controls uh, for for vaccines is part of that story. Um, the initial border closures, unilateral border closures, not cooperative uh, um, uh, border closures, are part of that story as well. So what I think we're we're seeing is the idea that there is sort of globalization taken too far is take is taken hold and the question now is whether we will go towards protectionism and autonomy and initi and, and finally autarky those the, those are the terms that describe the slippery slope or whether we um, go towards something that pascal Las lamy has has termed uh, precautionism that does accept uh, globalization that does uh, accept the division of labor the, as a principle, but that does, on the other hand, um, um, sort of question the principle of just-in-time delivery, and therefore um, it, it talks about stockpiling, talks about uh, a broader array of of distribution so, uh, distribution sources a broader sourcing of uh, that keeps globalization alive 
but combines it with the idea that there can be shocks to the system and that one has to be prepared to deal with the shocks to the system. So I would hope the latter is where we're going, but clearly the European Union is a good example of a roller coaster ride between uh, between the two. It has been part of a, a, a main a main supporter of COVAX, the, the international um, alliance to vaccinate, including the global south. But on the other hand, it's been, uh, it's been uh, twice now introducing export controls as a last measure. Now, I don't think, and I'll close with, with that thought, that internationalism should be defined that you vaccinate somebody else before you vaccinate your own people. If that is the threshold of internationalism, internationalism is going to necessarily fail. I think one should define as the airplanes define. If you have the masks coming down in a case of oxygen failure in a, in a plane, the flight attendant will tell you, please put the mask over your nose, then take care of your neighbor. So I think there is an, a definition of internationalism that needs to be more realistic and more congruent with human nature than what we sometimes expect of ourselves. It is impossible to discuss the impact of 2020 in terms of security perceptions without looking at America, the world's superpower who is wounded, bleeding, and at times at the verge of revolution. The, the contrast between the bombastic rhetoric of the last four years and the collapse of the system as we've seen it, primarily the, the death toll, w was striking not only for the outside lookers, the, the rest of the world, but also it must have been uh, a wake-up call for very many Americans. Uh, or was it? I mean, Thomas, you, you, you know the American soul much better than, than me. Is there going to be a reflection on the other side of the Atlantic about what does it mean to really be secure and what does it really mean to be the most powerful nation in the world? Most certainly. Um, America is, has always been an island of security that has seen itself unaffected by, by global trends, uh, protected by oceans, uh, protected by only two and two friendly neighbors, and the two most important shocks to the system uh, were Pearl Harbor and 9-11, uh, where, where the US was affected on its shores, um, and one was even the island off its shores. Um, so this this virus will probably affect the collective psyche of the uh, of the United States more than the collective psyche of countries that are connected with other countries by land masses. So I do think that the American uh, the American mind w will have a more long lasting effect uh, of this than uh, than other countries. But the question is how. Uh, I, I think the. The, the, some people argue that this um, is an attack on the idea of American exceptionalism. It is certainly something that um, undermines the American model of global leadership and global leadership um, as, as an exemplary country. Um, that I think will be, will be affected. And it also tells Americans who have a history of, of extreme changes from one, uh, one, from one outlook to the other, and also of mood changes of, of, as you said it in your question, of a bombastic rhetoric of grandiose achievement to, um, to a complete self-assessment of failure. We've seen that multiple times over the, la over the last decades, including the post-Vietnam War. But it also tells you that America usually recovers from these from, uh, from these waves uh, of, of collective depression that clearly America is in now. Based on what we said just moments ago, it seems legitimate to say that this may emphasize the trends in America, which lead to more isolationism. 
more inward looking policies. Even the, um, the bottom line of the new administration is build back better, build at home to be better also outside. We used to think that isolationist ideas in the United States were sort of automatically linked to the presidency of Donald Trump in the you know, past four years. But is it really so? There's a very good new book out on that question, Charlie Kupchin's uh, book on American isolationism, uh, that recounts the history of, uh, uh, of isolationism and uh, how America has fared well uh, uh, with it for 100 years or, or longer, that only in the, in the late 19th and early 20th century, the first challenges uh, to the American isolationism arose, and it is no coincident that the first attempt to internationalize uh, Woodrow Wilson's attempt failed. Um, and only in, in the end Pearl Harbor changed uh, uh, that outlook. So we have to take into account that there is an element of self-sufficiency in, uh, in, in, in the American collective mind uh, that is popular in America that we've seen re-emerge over the last years. Um, but the question is, is that isolationism or will it lead to isolationism or is it the correction of a previous overreach? Because the unilateral moment uh, that, we, that we recall is the first time in world history in which uh, there was liberal hegemony, that there was the um, the ability of the liberal democracy to call the shots globally led by the United States. Now that was a very short, very brief, and one could arguably say not very successful moment. And that we are now seeing um, an element of correction that is limitation. Of course that is driven by sort of an isolationist core. Will it lead to uh, isolationism, I'm not so sure because the, 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 the slogan that you have just quoted with, uh, with um, Joe Biden, build back better, also applies in his mind to alliances. He wants to build back the alliances better. Uh, precondition of that is that you have a trusted, trustworthy and functioning government at home. So what I see is rather not an American problem but I see a Western problem. I see the same erosion of trust in our governments and the same sense of overstretch in, in, in many of our democratic societies. I believe we're in that same boat together. So America, at least for the moment, and at least in the initial narratives of the new administration, is back uh, and perhaps even in need to be backed by, by its allies. But let's, let's get back to Europe, uh, which may have been less wounded by the pandemic than America, but, but which will face equally important dilemmas about its security. And just uh, everybody in Europe seems to be aware that Europe needs to do more, more swiftly, more cohesively, in dealing with uh, health threats, uh, as well as as well as um, there is a growing re growing realization that Europe needs to generally do more uh, uh, for its defense. Um, this is also the major subject of uh, transatlantic uh, discussions. America's growing engagement and focus on on Asia which results or may result in less engagement and less presence in, in Europe. And let's face it, the growing disagreements, strategic disagreements about uh, the role of Europe in the global uh, sphere versus or um, with the United States. All these combined seem to be pushing Europe to go its own way, maybe not yet uh, go alone. Is it? possible to keep the transatlantic bond uh, on one hand and have some strategic autonomy on the other? Uh, or will Europe inevitably over time become a competitor uh, to the United States? No, I don't believe that's 
our future. Uh, it, we, we shouldn't want this to be our uh, our future. I'm not a very I'm not a very happy camper when it comes to the term strategic autonomy uh, and uh, and European sovereignty. If sovereignty means capability and ability to act, I'm fully on board. We need to do that for, in order to be a good partner of the United States, to even be useful to the United States and be useful to ourselves, more importantly. Um, but capability and capacity and willingness and ability to act are different from sovereignty. Sovereignty runs the danger at least as conceived of by those who propose it, of putting Europe into a strategic no man's land, somewhere between China, Russia, and the United States. And that, I think, is the danger of the concept. So I think it's an ill-conceived idea that gets us nowhere. We need to, to think about our own ability to act in unison and our own ability to act in unison together with the United States. Just as I believe that there is no problem that the United States has alone that we have that we have shared uh, problems, I believe that the solution to these problems will come from from Western democracies and not from singular singling out Europe. And without a solution to our deep crisis of trust within our populations, within the, the biggest and largest and most traditional of our democracies, I also think we will find a good solution in Europe itself. I know that you are not uh, a, a fan of this term uh, strategic autonomy. And forgive me, it may have been a little provocation from my side to uh, allow you to, to express your criticism um, of the term. But I would like you to help me decipher the other part of this uh, equation. That is, what does it mean that Europe needs to do more on security and defense? Uh, exactly who should do what, when, uh, and in what sense more? I, I think what we need is a new consensus and a new bargain transatlantically. America renews with the new presidency its commitment to European defense. And that is largely an Article 5 commitment, but it also has a nuclear component of nuclear sharing, of deterrence. While the Europeans uh, take on the task of what I, I don't call it burden, sharing, I would like to call it burden shifting. Uh, the Europeans need to be able to do two things. One is to deter conventional uh, attack on the European homeland, uh, and that is conventional homeland territorial defense. And the burden of that goes to the larger European land-based countries, and I mean my own country, first and foremost. Now, that is the country most lacking that commitment and lacking uh, that insight and lacking the willingness to make progress quickly. It has made progress. It has made even significant progress in turning the tide, but nowhere close to what is necessary. I always feel that the Germans are moving, but the environment is moving faster. So the gap, gap keep, keeps growing, even though the Germans feel they're moving. Um, so that is the, but it's not just a German phenomenon. When you look at the smaller European countries, they often hide in their defense, uh, uh, in their defense quotas behind Germany. Uh, there's only very few countries who actually do what they've promised to do in Europe. So we need to be able to do that in order to relieve America of, uh, of, of some of its duties in Europe. That, by the way, also means some adjustment of its perspective on the, uh, on the part of Poland. It needs to become more reliant on its European uh, on its European partners, and the European partners also need to provide that. Uh, so I think that in conventional terms, that's the, uh, that's, the, that's the deal. And the second part of the deal concerns China. Um, uh, I, I, I think there is different interests overlapping, but in some elements, different interests vis-a-vis -vis China in Europe than in the United States vis-a-vis -vis China. 
but we can converge on those. We, I think, need to accept that there are security caveats and technology caveats to our trade with China. And America needs to accept that from a European perspective, uh, two things are important. One, a complete decoupling is unrealistic and probably dangerous. Uh, and uh, the European defense commitment to uh, to China is a far-fetched idea. But what we should want to do is support and understand and do no harm to uh, the American concern vis-a-vis -vis China. So there needs to be an alignment on China that respects uh, these differences in, in national and continental interests. One more thing about the uh, doing more for security and defense in Europe. Um, you, you did not mention the magic number, the 2%. Is this debate over now with um, the farewell of uh, President Trump? Uh, or the Biden administration will reshape the uh, debate on, commitment, on commitments? Um, as a German in my country, uh, I would say Donald Trump has successfully killed 2%. I don't know of a single politician who would go out into his constituency and defend 2% uh, on, 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 the, on the assumption that this is what America is demanding. First of all, that's the wrong definition. It's not America. We've all committed to two German governments have. Um, but that's a perception. It's something that people can no longer invest political capital into. So the framing, in my view, has to be changed. And the way one can change it is to say we've made that commitment uh, in the summits in 2014 and, and subsequently. Ten years on, let's look at where what we've come and what we need today. And what we should be doing is to look at NATO capability and defense planning and look at the commitments on substance there that we are able to fulfill those. Those commitments, by the way, that my country has taken go far beyond the 2024 deadline and are largely uh, uh, larger uh, in, in scope and go, go towards 2031. Now, I don't ask for a rebate for anybody, including for my own country. But I, uh, but what I think would be politically helpful is uh, is to shape and change the, the way towards what we really what we really need, and what the, how the needs have changed during the last ten years. What we will also need to account for, and that is the most difficult piece of the future capabilities debate, is how do you uh, account for COVID. During the last crisis, 20, uh, 2008, the financial crisis, European defense capabilities thereafter declined by 30 uh, percent in the time of austerity that followed. What are we going to do uh, post-COVID, where we've spent and deficit spent uh, as if there was no tomorrow? So we're going to need to bring a line, a line the, uh, the defense necessities with, uh, with the, the budget constraints in order to avoid this type of a dramatic drop. Thank you, Thomas, for this. Thank you for this conversation. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, sir. My second guest in the security block of this year's Risk and Trends Conference is a retired three-star U.S. Army General Frederick Ben Hodges. Lieutenant General Hodges spent almost 40 years in uniform, and his last military assignment was as commanding general of the U.S. Army Europe, exactly at the time when NATO and the U.S. forces in Europe had to reform and adapt to new reality caused by Russia's aggression and non-military malign activities. Now, Mr. Hodges, holds a strategic studies position at, in Washington-based think tank SIPA, named after one of the greatest American generals, Joseph John Pershing, and looks far beyond Europe, to Asia, to Arctic, to the Indo-Pacific, and of course, uh, to China. 
So, General Hodges, welcome to Politica Insights Risk and Trends 2021. I'm glad to have you with us. It's a privilege. Thank you. And I'm going to start this conversation with you, uh, more or less where I have ended it with uh, Thomas Kleine Brokov, our first uh, guest on the conference. That is with China. And I would like to quote you from another conference a few years ago when you said, it is very likely that the United States will be at war with China in 15 years. This assessment made headlines all over the world, but almost uh, three years later, we know a bit, a bit more about China. We know a bit more about the United States. And of course, due to pandemic that generated in China and hit the US very hard, the world is now in a very much different situation. So you have probably spent a lot of time thinking about the impact of 2020 on the US-China uh, tension. What is your outlook today? Well, Mark, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I was wrong when I said 15 years. I, I think it's five years. Uh, I'm much more concerned now than I was uh, even three years ago in Warsaw. Um, when I see the fact that the West has failed to adequately respond to Chinese uh, human rights abuses with the Uyghurs, the uh, oppression of people in Hong Kong, uh, the continued, in fact, increasingly threatening language and activity towards Taiwan, uh, the continued uh, threatening activity in the South China Sea, and the fact that the West, I mean, even UK, did not really respond in a meaningful way to Hong Kong. Um, so I, I actually think that the Chinese, uh, especially the Chinese military, want a conflict. And so I, I think it's a possibility within five years, not a probability, but a possibility. This sounds very, very alarming also to, you know, people like us here in, in Europe and, and in, in Eastern Europe on NATO's Eastern uh, flank, because we remember very well the Cold War times when, again, the war seemed to be uh, very likely, but it didn't happen uh, for so many years. Tell me in what way then is the US-China rivalry different from the US-Soviet uh, rivalry in the uh, 20th century's Cold War um, and from US-Russia rivalry in, in that, that is happening in, in recent uh, years. Is it, is it only about the size? Is it about, uh, only about the uh, physical potential of, of the opponent, the economic efficiency? of China, or maybe the entire environment has changed so much that the, the competition takes place in, in a much more uh, uh, complex uh, dimension. And, and it is by far not only in military terms. So I think there are probably three uh, main differences. Um, number one, in the Cold War, when you had NATO and the Soviet Union, uh, there was a sort of a... Uh, uh, it was a confrontation, but there was an understanding of sorts, and there was a balance of power there and, the, and so many nuclear weapons on both sides. And so I actually felt, I think people felt more confident then that something could be controlled or prevented from actually happening, the idea of deterrence. Uh, with the Chinese Communist Party, the, the big difference is the geography. I mean, they're on the other side of the world, literally. Uh, from the United States and, and from Europe. And so we don't have the same geographical sort of feel um, to, to be able to understand uh, what they're thinking and what they're doing. So the geography uh, is, is the first big difference. The, the second big difference, of course, is uncertainty about our most important allies, um, meaning the United States is not sure. And by the way, we have not done a good job for many years now building up our alliances um, to deal with uh, the Chinese Communist Party. So you have Germany, several other countries that seem to prioritize the uh, economic relationship with China more than uh, perhaps holding the Chinese Communist Party accountable for what it's doing to the Uyghurs and, the, and Hong Kong and so on. Um, that, that's not true of all of our allies, but certainly Germany being the leader in the European Union and a leader in NATO, that's, that matters. Um, the third uh, component to this is economics, as you say. You know, there was no Soviet investment in infrastructure in Western Europe or um, in Southern Europe. The way the Chinese have uh, now 
they extended their economic reach all the way to Duisburg in Germany, which is the literally the end of the uh, New Silk Road. And, um, of course, the infrastructure projects throughout Europe and Africa and uh, Asia are, are well known. So this is a different type of competition uh, that we have um, that we have failed to enter. So given all these links, given all the influence that China has on the Western world, um, the overwhelming powers of number uh, 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 as well, you, you, can, you can come to a conclusion that it is simply impossible to uh, fight China and, and, and win and be successful. H how do you deter a country like that, a system like that, uh, in fact? What are the ways to control it and to stop the expansion uh, if that decision is taken? And, and can you tell me how to win a war with China if, times, uh, if, if time comes to, to, to fight it? For instance, if it attacks uh, Taiwan, which actually is something they are discussing in, in Beijing. Does the U.S. know how to do it, or does anyone know? So, um, Mark, for sure the United States knows how uh, to fight, and if it came to that, uh, it would be incredibly violent, it would be, it would be terrible. Um, but what I, what I think it's more important to focus on is not failed deterrence, um, but to think about great power competition, I, I believe that great power competition prevents great power conflict. And that means you have to compete in diplomacy, uh, with information, and with the military, and with economic means. And of course, the United States needs allies, it needs partners to do this effectively against China. There is zero interest and zero need. Uh, nobody's even thinking about uh, a land war with China on the Asian mainland. That's that's not what we're talking about. So when we talk about winning a war with China, what we really are talking about is protecting America's strategic interests and protect, helping to protect the strategic interests of our allies and partners. So um, this competition uh, needs to in include, from a military standpoint, of course, protecting freedom of navigation, uh, but also protecting economic investments, uh, protecting our allies in South Korea, in Japan, uh, and in Australia, of course. And that's also why you see more cooperation with the United States and India. Uh, part of establishing a, an alliance um, that is able to persuade Beijing that a conflict is in nobody's interest. That's, that's how we win. Would you then uh, support creating something like an Asian or Indo-Pacific version of NATO to be as successful as the European or North Atlantic NATO in preventing a big war happening in 20th century? Well, um, the United States has uh, bilateral relationships with several um, Asian countries, and um, there are there's an increasing uh, level of coordination, I would say, with countries in the region. Um, so just creating a NATO-like uh, treaty organization um, does not, is not a terrible idea, on, or is not a bad idea, but I don't know that, that that's what's necessary right now. So would you maybe um, see um, the traditional NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, being more active in support of the United States uh, versus China, taking much more uh, global role than only mandated by uh, its current uh, geographical limits. In other words, would you see maybe one day a NATO task force in South China Sea or elsewhere in support of Western and US interests? Yeah, I, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, I think that the alliance um, has a role for collective defense uh, of its members um, to, to try to persuade allies to send a, a task force, for example, out to the Pacific would, um, would, number one, divert those allies from their principal task, which is collective security here in Europe. But also, um, I, I think the role that NATO plays 
is to help build this, to be the strong European pillar, if you will. That's, this is what the United States is counting on, is a strong European pillar, um, not a European pillow. Um, you have to continue to deter the Kremlin. If we get into a conflict in the Pacific, most or a lot of our Navy, Air Force, intelligence capabilities will all be focused there. And so we would not want, obviously, the Kremlin to take advantage of the United States being distracted. And so that's why I think the role of the alliance is to continue to stay uh, focused uh, here on the European continent. Now, of course, uh, NATO has uh, intelligence capabilities, logistics capabilities. It's a framework um, that is not inconsequential. But I, I would not want to see the alliance distracted or stretched. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Now, for sure, um, Canada is a NATO ally, but Canada is also a Pacific nation. Uh, the UK um, has uh, Pacific interests, and so the Royal Navy, we know, is going to be a part of helping uh, with deterrence and, and ensuring freedom of navigation in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, the French uh, Navy has also indicated, has already been into the Pacific, so other nations not in support of the U.S., but in support of their own interest, uh, will be and are uh, operating in the Indo-Pacific region. Everybody in the world, everybody that's listening to your show, uh, to this program, has something in their home that comes from China. And so uh, protecting that trade is in the interest of everybody. You have just listed the uh, capabilities that will be very much needed or indispensable in uh, preventing China's uh, expansion and becoming uh, a true ally, if you will, of the United States in, in its new uh, global rivalry or, or, or fight. Uh, and, and this is a contradiction because, you know, the maritime going, the naval, uh, maritime going countries, the uh, naval powers uh, of Europe do not necessarily keep, maintain a robust land warfare capabilities, which are on the other hand so much uh, needed in the traditional role of NATO that you've just uh, mentioned. What to do about it? How to combine the two? Well, of course, um, the alliance needs significant increases in the U.S. Navy, uh, Royal Navy, Polish Navy. Uh, all, of, all of the allies um, have got to uh, increase maritime capabilities to ensure that we can protect each other in the Baltic region, in the Black Sea region, uh, and also so that we can operate across the Atlantic Ocean and in the Mediterranean. So uh, there is a lot of water inside the uh, NATO area of operations or responsibility. So having maritime capability is important. Uh, it's not exclusive of, it's not either or is what I mean to say. Um, I think that, of course, uh, resources for modern navies are very expensive. I mean, it, it's very expensive. Um, so we have to be um, smart about how we do this. Can we do more work together? Um, I think there's a, a real future for unmanned systems, for example. Um, smaller, uh, more efficient, they can do a lot of the activities in the Baltic Sea um, that would help ensure protection for each other. Uh, those are some things that could be done. Um, the potential for war is uh, increases the less prepared we are. An adversary could make the terrible miscalculation. You know, the Russian, the Kremlin could say, I don't think Poland and Lithuania are really ready and the U.S. can't get there in time. So we could attack across the Suwaki Corridor, for example. That's not likely, but we want to keep it unlikely. And you do that by having large, well-trained, prepared, ready forces uh, that are accustomed to training and operating together. That's land, sea, and air. And you have to demonstrate the ability to inflict really terrible punishment on an attacker. That's what deterrence is all about. They have to see that we are ready to unleash hell on them if they ever did attack. Hopefully, they won't. But if they do, then we're prepared for it. It's, it's too late once the attack starts. 
So one of these implications of the growing Chinese problem is that Europe needs to do more. And you've just said it between the lines. I'm hearing it constantly. We're all hearing this. Um, can you tell me who exactly needs to do what and when and in what sense more in terms of defense capabilities in Europe? Okay, so um, again, within the great power competition, diplomacy, information, military, and economic domains, uh, everybody in the military would prefer that the military component uh, backs up or supports diplomatic information and economic power. That's um, a critical part of deterrence. But nonetheless, uh, you have to have hard power in order to have effective soft power. And for sure, Poland, Romania, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia have all done uh, a terrific job. I mean, really uh, leaning forward in terms of modernization. That doesn't mean it's perfect. Nobody is totally satisfied. You can't rest. Uh, but in terms of uh, commitment, that's what I see uh, from the Polish people, and the Polish military, and the Polish government. And, of course, you see Sweden. Sweden has uh, announced a significant increase in their defense spending. Uh, Finland and Sweden uh, working hard on uh, whole-of-government uh, response. So the, the east flank um, nations are doing what needs to be done. Uh, where we have some challenges, uh, uh, number one is air and missile defense. Uh, there's not enough uh, capability in the Russians. I mean, President Putin brags about his hypersonic missiles and all these capabilities. And, of course, we've seen the, the, the effectiveness of unmanned systems, the drones that, that were on display in Ukraine and Syria, and most recently, Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, Germany has a critical role, I think, as the uh, sort of the transit hub for the alliance. For the United States, most everything would likely come into Germany and then move as quickly as possible towards where the crisis is or where the crisis may be. So transportation infrastructure in Germany, seaports, airports, highways, bridges, and then further across towards the east, uh, this has got to be uh, improved. And I think that investment in that critical infrastructure that has military uh, purpose should count towards 2%. And the cyber protection for that infrastructure is important. The, the seaport at Gdansk, uh, an excellent seaport, that is an important uh, port of entry. So if Poland improves that seaport and has uh, cyber protection for it, that, I think that should count. Um, and this is where things like Three Seas Initiative also figure in. The, the idea of, uh, of Rail Baltica, for example, uh, connecting uh, our three Baltic allies, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, with a, a rail that is common gauge with Europe. Um, or connecting the port of Gdansk all the way down to Constanta on the Black Sea. This kind of infrastructure that would allow the alliance to move uh, laterally is an important part of deterrence. Uh, the, the large transportation hub, the solidarity transportation hub between uh, Warsaw and Łódź, that's the kind of infrastructure that's necessary for uh, deterrence. Um, the previous administration seemed to be very much focused on this magic number that you've mentioned, the 2% of uh, GDP for, for defense spending. But, you know, when you see the charts published by NATO Secretary General, it seems as though, you know, it didn't quite work. Still, it is the minority of uh, NATO countries that um, fulfill the pledge. Um, maybe the discussion should go into capabilities and commitments. And we see that discussion going in, in that direction. You will probably say uh, it's good. But on the other hand, you can only have um, commitment, commitments and, and capabilities once you have enough money. So maybe the 2% or even more is not that bad idea. So I'm, I'm not against 2% as one of the metrics. Uh, but it, it can't be the only metric. And, and I think, candidly, it was unfortunate that um, the previous uh, American president put so much emphasis on 2% without um, 
and, and did it in a way that damaged the cohesion of NATO. I mean, that's that's really what gives us the, the best deterrence is when the Kremlin looks over and he sees 30 nations totally committed with American commitment unquestioned. That's what um, deterrence is. Uh, when you see cracks in that, to include nations not doing their part, th those are cracks and vulnerabilities that the Kremlin will exploit. Now, uh, everybody agreed to 2%, including all the nations that are not meeting it or, and won't meet it. They all agreed to it. Um, so I think there's no, there's no value in, in saying let's get rid of 2%, but it cannot be the only uh, metric. You're right about the, the discussion of capabilities uh, being a critical contribution. I talked about some of them earlier. I, I think we could be more sophisticated about what 2% means. Um, cyber protection of our transportation infrastructure would be at the top of, at the top of my list, and then improving infrastructure overall. Um, at the end of the day, you know, 2%, if you think about if somebody's GDP, I mean, I hear people joke that uh, Germany might meet 2% after all if their GDP uh, is reduced as a result of COVID. Um, you know, that's, it's a kind of a, a sarcasm, but it also highlights the fact that 2% may not give you what you need. Um, I, I think what I expect from the new administration is that the new administration will turn to our uh, European allies and say, look, um, the United States is committed forever to NATO. So uh, President Biden is going to remove all doubt about American commitment to the alliance. He called Secretary General Stoltenberg in his first couple of days in office. Uh, Secretary of Defense Austin called Secretary General Stoltenberg his first morning in the Pentagon. So um, I am committed. I'm, I'm sure that the United States is totally committed. That's not going to change. But the pressure from Washington will still be there on Berlin, uh, uh, on other allies, uh, that they have got to do um, their share uh, of the uh, contributing to deterrence. And the Chinese problem makes it even more complicated. I mean, we, we can agree that the 2% may be enough in terms of deterring and, and protecting Europe from, from Russia. But if uh, NATO and the US allies within NATO need to take uh, a much gro global role in support of, of US and Western interests versus China, as you said, half the globe across, then the 2% is next to nothing. Is there any discussion how costly the task, the new task uh, of the Western militaries will be? Well, of course, um, cost is always a factor um, in every capital and in every ministry um, as you think about what's required. And, um, you know, the reality is uh, you, with the strategy you start off with, you know, what are our strategic interests? What do we need to do? What do we need to do to protect or achieve those strategic interests? And almost everybody will come to the conclusion that they need allies because nobody, including the United States, has enough capacity to do everything. So uh, that's a critical part of, uh, of what it is we have to do. The, um, and of course, everybody has to decide what risks they're going to take because we can't afford everything that you could possibly need. So then it's the responsibility of the president, of the prime minister, of the uh, parliament um, to explain to their population, here's where we're going to take risk. Um, and you try to find ways to mitigate that, that risk. Um, it, this is the hard part I mean, because we can't afford everything that we need. So it takes some real political courage and moral courage from our leaders to explain why we need what we need. Uh, there's reluctance in some leaders to talk about the threat in a, in a real clear-eyed way, because once you uh, demonstrate or declare something as a threat, then the population expects you to do something about it. Mm. Let's get back to the fields and forests of Europe for the final minutes of our conversation. Um, this year will be marked by two major military operations in Europe. That is the um, 
Defender Europe 21 series of exercise by the United States and NATO allies and partners. And on the other hand, the Zappa 21 exercise by Russia and Belarus. It is the first time that the two uh, are actually happening in, in, within few few months. They do not formally overlap, but there will clearly be some kind of interaction or maybe strategic dialogue, dialogue uh, happening. What do you expect? Well, what I expect is that for Defender 21, uh, the United States and uh, our allies will have a great exercise. We'll be very transparent. Um, it will be declared. Uh, we'll have um, uh, observers from Russia, Belarus, other countries, as we did on the last big exercise in Poland uh, that I participated in, the Anaconda exercise, where you had uh, observers from those countries. That's, that's what we do in the West is we have transparency uh, for our exercise. There'll be journalists everywhere watching everything, reporting. Uh, from the Kremlin side, uh, I expect the usual uh, total fabrication uh, lies and false narrative about what they're doing and how big it is. I mean, they we remember um, the last Zapod, they said there were only 12,000. Only not even a brand new lieutenant would have believed that. But yet that's what comes from the the uh, Kremlin uh, of, a, of a nation that claims to be uh, a superpower and wants to be a leader in the world. Uh, to lie about things like that. Uh, that's why um, countries that live along NATO's eastern flank are always concerned by these exercises because of the lack of transparency. Um, here in Poland, we concentrate obviously on this northeastern direction uh, because Russia borders directly the uh, NATO countries here. But um, in terms of Russia's strategic interests, it may be so that the Black Sea direction, the, the southern part of the eastern flank, is much more important because it gives the Russians uh, much more uh, free access to the so-called uh, warm seas. Is this why Defender Europe 21 concentrates on this southern um, flank of the eastern flank this year? No. The, the Defender series of exercises, of course, is planned uh, years in advance. And I believe that the concept is that each year it will alternate. So Defender 20 was you know, in Northeast um, Europe last year. This year it'll be in Southeastern Europe. And then it'll go back, back and forth. And, and the reason for doing that, of course, is to uh, practice moving in all directions uh, to make sure that the uh, the various seaports in the Baltic region, but also in the Black Sea region and um, the Adriatic, are prepared um, to to receive large uh, American equipment or equipment from Western Europe as well. So this this is a practical reason for doing this. But you are you are correct, Mark, as you usually are. Uh, the Black Sea region is extremely important to the uh, to the Kremlin. I believe that the Baltic Sea, uh, we could achieve sea control in the early days if there was a crisis. I mean, when you think about Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Germany, Denmark, plus our partners, Sweden and Finland, um, Kaliningrad is actually uh, a liability for the Kremlin. Uh, if, if, assuming that we all work closely together and are at the right level of readiness, the Black Sea a different geography. You have three allies, Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey, and then you've got three partners, Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia, um, And we, but we don't have a strategy for the region. I don't think that Brussels or Washington appreciates the strategic importance of the Black Sea region. Um, there is very little investment there uh, in infrastructure. Um, there's Western European countries do not have uh, what I would call economic skin in the game. Uh, and so that's why you end up now with uh, Russian troops in all three countries of South Caucasus, uh, Georgia, uh, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. I mean, that was the last corridor between Eurasia and Europe that did not go through uh, Russia or Iran. And now you've got Russian troops there because we um, have not competed. We, don't, we didn't put the right um, strategic value there. So I'm glad that the alliance is practicing 
in the Black Sea region. And that's also why I believe Georgia and Ukraine should both be in NATO. Let me ask you a final question about your outlook for 2021 and beyond. And let's start with the um, situation of the US troops in Europe, specifically in Germany, where you also uh, live. We've just heard from President Biden uh, that he halted the uh, planned withdrawal uh, from uh, Germany of uh, 12,000 uh, or so uh, US troops. Um, but there will be a major global review of postures, so some relocation still uh, may happen. Um, how about stationing some more US troops in countries like Poland? How about the Regikova uh, missile defense base? Uh, is it going to be finished this year, finally? Tell me your bets. So. Um, number one, obviously, I personally was uh, pleased to hear um, the uh, announcement that uh, any planned withdrawal of U.S. troops from uh, from Europe uh, has been halted, uh, placed in uh, on hold until a review is done. And this is this is entirely normal. I would expect a new administration would automatically do a review of force structure around the world, and it'll be done in a professional. Uh, interagency process with the Congress being informed and with allies being consulted. This is normal. And so, of course, as a result of that process, there may be some moving around, but I don't, I don't anticipate much, uh, much change. Um, it is so expensive, the idea of relocating the headquarters from Stuttgart to Mons, for example. That would be billions of dollars. Um, the idea of leaving uh, Air Force in UK instead of coming to Spangdalem, uh, would hurt readiness because the quality of the base at Spangdalem is is so much better. Um, now, I would be happy to see increased U.S. troops uh, in Poland, Lithuania, Romania, uh, all up and down NATO's eastern flank. I would love that, uh, assuming that those those nations wanted it, but also assuming that uh, the alliance wanted it. Um, General Ben Hodges former commander of U.S. Army Europe. Thank you very much for being with us. Always a pleasure to talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. And to our viewers, thank you very much for the time you spent before your screens. I encourage you to watch other recordings from Risks and Trends 2021. I would also like to thank the partners of this year's conference.